just in the spirit of having this being a concluding uh, discussion or a wrap-up discussion. Um, our the title of this conference is Beyond, the Gold, Beyond Golden Age and Decline. And then there's a subtitle, which is very different. <laughs> the Legacy of Muslim Societies and Global Modernity. We haven't talked about the subtitle very much. Right. <clears throat> We've only talked about golden age and decline. Uh, frankly, I think that uh, the, if you look into the genealogy of decline, uh, you get to Edward Gibbon, and that the whole resonance of that word is based on the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. And um, Giancarlo has pointed out that when Lewis specified the decline uh, for the Ottomans, that he was reading it, he was reading Ottoman texts. And if you if you ask where do people of let's say policymakers or <clears throat> uh, people of consequence get their ideas about decline in the Muslim world. Um, they didn't read Bernard Lewis. They didn't read the uh, Braschvig's old uh, symposium on uh, uh, classicism and cultural decline. <clears throat> they talked to leaders in the Muslim world. Mm -hmm. They talked to political leaders who trashed their own people. When General Omar Suleiman said the Egyptians are not ready for democracy, he, was, he did not stand out. That is what people have been saying for the last 150 years. <clears throat> In, uh, in Middle Eastern polities, partly because they believe it, but more than that, because they think that's what the Americans want to hear. And that they are, it is their way of becoming um, compradors, of becoming uh, allies of the imperial overlord. So that uh, one of the great problems has been, not so much that Bernard wrote something that, <coughs> that impresses John more than me, um, <laughs> But the fact that, uh, that the, the, the elites in the Middle East, uh, secular national, uh, nationalist elites, government leaders, generals, and so forth and so on, have been uh, suck-ups to the imperial overlords. And that's us, at least. I'm speaking <laughs> as American here. Um, so, so there's a problem there. But it's also an opportunity because those elites are now quivering with fear. They are shaking in their boots because their time has come. And now is the time to, in a way we've never had it before. We didn't even have it this way six months ago. Now is the time to actually try and launch alternative interpretations because the old interlocutors uh, are no longer standing on firm ground and the Americans don't have the foggiest idea of what to think you know, from <clears throat> from Obama and Hillary Clinton uh, down to uh, the man in the street. Nobody has a clue as to what's going on. What a great time. This is an opportunity. And the Israelis don't know what's going on either. I mean, this, this is, a, this is a, a moment we've never seen before. And there, so this is a time not simply to have an exchange among scholars, um, but to, uh, to try to formulate alternative um, Approaches now, uh, you know there may be some people who are um, enthusiastic about Bernard Lewis uh, in this room. Personally, I don't think we've beat him up enough, so I'm going to do a little more. Um, Super. The, what what Bernard did, his worst book. <coughs> I know there's a competition on this, but his worst book uh, was not what went wrong. His worst book was the Muslim discovery of Europe. That's the one where he starts out by saying, "This is a book." parallel that will talk about the Muslim discovery of Europe in parallel to the European discovery of the wide world in the era of reconnaissance and the, 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 the message is it never happened because the Muslims have no curiosity, they have no inventiveness, they don't learn languages, they are simply dullards. Now that resonates much more with the, uh, with the current portrayals uh, then, then the word declined. I mean, decline is kind of a technical thing. We can debate decline. You know, is it 5% decline, 10% decline, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the notion that, that the Muslims in the world are kind of, you know, fakil. I mean, that they're, they're, they're thick. They're, that they, they can't invent anything. Um, that has been 
uh, uh, something that has gone around, and it is something that has been shaken by the crowds in the street and Tahrir Square, uh, and Pearl Square, and so forth, because now I think the American people are saying, you know, these people actually, maybe they're, maybe they're admirable. They, maybe they can do something uh, important. Maybe we should revisit our notion of who and what they are and what, what they're capable of. Now here, uh, I have to um, uh, call to mind a couple of inter, uh, interventions by uh, Ahmed Kara Mustafa saying, you know, everything you're talking about would be totally nonsensical at a meeting of the American Academy of Religions because the discourse in the religion field is totally different from that in the history field. This is, this is a problem, uh, and it's, uh, they, I think that was correctly observed. So one of the things is, um, should we have shunned religion to the degree that we did? Now you can say we didn't shun religion, we talked about Sharia, uh, we talked about uh, political theory, but we didn't talk about Sufi brotherhoods, um, and we didn't talk about conversion. Now, the legacy of Muslim societies in global modernity, 1300, 1900. 1300, 1900 is the golden age of Islam. Most, well, let's say a majority of all the Muslims in the world today are the direct descendants of people who converted to Islam after the Mongol conquest, not before. They are not having a voice in our current discussions of Islam in the world, and yet, they make up very large proportions of the, uh, of the uh, human migration population that is coming into all parts of the Western world and all parts of the world altogether. Um, so, you know, I don't want to go back to my Muslim North, Muslim South argument, but, but the, fact of the, matter, the fact of the matter is, um, we should be able to talk about uh, the Muslim South. The, the Africans, West Africans, East Africans, uh, South Arabia. We never talk about South Arabia. We should be able to talk about, um, uh, well, say Southern India as opposed to simply the Delhi area. Uh, Bangladesh, which is south of 25 north latitude. Um, Southeast Asia, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and some other outlying areas like China. Uh, this is where the new, the new Muslim populations came into being. Now, why would vast numbers of people in the world convert to a religion that was in the midst of decline? It makes no sense. That is the, the most obvious refutation to the argument of decline that you can have that millions and millions and pe millions of people voted with their faith to become Muslims at a period where we in the West are saying, oh, well, that's in decline. Now, if you go into the detail of the content of the faith, people will say, oh, well, a lot of that is Sufi mysticism and uh, you know, backward-looking medieval superstitions and so forth, as if Christian Europe isn't full of the same stuff, but, um, or Christian America even more. Uh, but the thing is, you can look at it a different way. And the slogan I would use is, Islam, the open civilization. If you look at Europe, Europe goes around the world. It brings in uh, foodstuffs and uh, design motifs and uh, you know, daily uh, practices and size of clothing from other parts of the world. There's not a single idea that the Europeans ever pick up from anywhere else in the world and give it any, any mileage. They're very open to new ideas so long as they're European ideas. So we praise the Enlightenment, but we see, but we admit nobody into the category of the Enlightened who's not a European. Uh, unless, you know, unless they're a student of, of Kant or something, I mean, you know, there are a few. Um, uh, but if you look at Islam during this period, it is the most open uh, civilization the world has ever seen. <coughs> Islam is not only open to everybody, but it integrates. It, everybody who comes into Islam feels a part of Islam, even though their particular uh, you know, parochial version of it may not pass the Salafi uh, 
uh, purity test. Nevertheless, I think this is, this is terribly important. This is what makes the Ummah so different from, say, the worldwide Christian faith community. This is what makes the Hajj the most important uh, cultural institution in the world. Uh, it is the fact that Muslims of every stripe, um, or checkers, or polka dots, or whatever, uh, they're all Muslims. They're all in the Ummah. And because Islam is the open uh, civilization. And I think that the, um, you know, we have, uh, in a sense, bought into uh, the Salafi argument that there's something impure about certain types of Islam and other types of Islam are the only ones that are acceptable. Well, let the Salafis try and sell their doctrine. They, you know, they're successful in some areas, they're not successful in other areas. But, but for most Muslims, <coughs> um, uh, you know, their future is not a Wahhabi future. And they're proud of their traditions. If you, uh, I live in New York where, uh, where most of the Senegalese taxi drivers are Muridis. Um, and, uh, and you find about the Muridia if you talk to them, where those who aren't Muridis are Bangladeshis or something. I mean, you know, Islam is such a remarkably fruitful and uh, diverse uh, community. But if you look at the Ottoman, Safavid, and Mughal empires, uh, it's there, and yet there's a defensiveness uh, about it. And I think that, in a sense, we have two different discourses. One that we have highlighted, which is, let us fight back this notion of decline, because uh, it didn't happen, or uh, you know, there are other interpretations of it. But I'd rather have follow a different discourse, a parallel one, in which we, we say that the characterization of Muslims as a faith community, as being dull, unimaginative, backward, devoid of curiosity, devoid of, of openness to new ideas, uh, that is fundamentally wrong. Uh, and I think that we, uh, that this is where we should be, uh, we, we should be retargeting our message. Um, if, if I were a South Asian Muslim living in Bradford, or a um, uh, Afghan taxi driver, or a uh, Bangladeshi working in the Gulf, or I mean, a Shiite Lebanese in Nigeria, or a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a Puerto Rican convert to Islam in New York City, lots of, of Hispanic converts to Islam, um, I wouldn't think much of a discussion that talked about the Ottoman, Safavid, and Mughal worlds. I would say that's very important for the academics. And it is. I'm glad we've had the conference. I think we've had some wonderful mm -hmm. stuff. But if this is the moment when there is a rare opportunity to, uh, to reshape a discourse. We can't do it by simply saying that, uh, that the idiom of decline doesn't work. We have to be more proactive and come out with something else that is inclusive rather than restricted to the polities that we have been talking about. And uh, I don't know, I only thought of the phrase, Islam, the open civilization, five minutes before the session started, so I'm not invested in it. And I'd be happy to have someone who has a better one, but, uh, but I happen to think that, that, that that's the spirit that we, should be, um, that we should be aiming at, is to be inclusive, contemporary, and conscious of the fact that this period from 1300 to 1900 was a great period for Islam, a great period for Islam. Uh, rather than uh, a period of decline and so forth and so on. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Okay. What I would suggest is that we now have time for questions, 